Greetings on a beautiful, somewhat rainy day. I am reading Revelations Unfolded. I'm not quite sure who the author is. I downloaded this PDF a few years ago and taking the chance now to give it a good reading. Um, so I'm starting out in chapter three, The Beast. The individual pursuit of happiness has led to the rapid intellectual and technological evolution of the human species. Though these advances have come from the wise ones yearning to fulfill the measure of their creation individually, they have had little effect, if any, on the desired end of their existence, happiness. When more knowledge is acquired by the whole, it has the potential of creating widespread equality and understanding. But this threatens individuality, the purpose of human existence. Knowledge is what is agreed upon through mutual experience and perception. It's not synonymous with real truth, because it changes as other facts are acquired which negate the accepted truth upon which it was based. The accumulation of knowledge does little to bring happiness to a person except as a distinction that protects or promotes individuality. To protect this self-perception and to set it as a distinction between themselves and others, some would seek to acquire superior knowledge that sets them above the masses. When these are accepted as being more knowledgeable, they take advantage of the perception these gain powers or the need of their followers to maintain individuality and it feels set apart from others these become leaders some are not convinced of a leader's superior knowledge and understanding because in doing so they would lose their own individuality by succumbing to the direction in which the leader has pointed the followers. These, re these will rebel against the leader, and they become enemies of the leader's self-image and power. The first leader recognized in the human experience is the parent who forms a family unit. Through no choice of its own, and in its early years, the child becomes an inculcated follower of the traditions, beliefs, and customs or knowledge of its parents. The parents base their knowledge on time-honored respect for, the, uh, for what has been taught to them. To protect these traditions, parents unite with other followers. They form communities of families that are led in the same direction by whomever or whatever they have chosen as their leader. These leaders protect the knowledge upon which the followers have agreed. These communities then form cities and nations based on shared perceptions of individuality. The nations are led by the leaders who have convinced their followers of their superior knowledge and the ability to protect the core of their power. The family unit established through individuality. Leaders answer to themselves or to the images and illusions that they have created that support their personal agendas. If the leader has the support of the nation, then the people have been convinced that whomever or whatever guides and gives direction to the leader is truth. In ancient times, humans honored and worshipped their leaders because they were convinced that unseen and powerful gods led and directed them. As knowledge increased and spread to the masses, these unseen gods were replaced with other intangible gods, which, which had just as much power over the minds and motives of the people as did their mortal leaders. Whatever god is chosen, the leaders maintain control over the people by perpetuating and promoting the gods in which the people believe. Unseen gods religiously motivate humans to revere the whole to which the individuals belong, subjecting all to the will of these mysterious forces. 
These gods are known and accepted by people who have placed their faith and support in mortal leaders who have convinced them of the supernatural essence in which they should believe. It could be profoundly stated that a god is the equivalent of a powerful human motivator. And by utilizing this knowledge, leaders establish themselves above others, fulfilling their true nature of individual self-awareness, but are never able to satisfy their followers' desires to arrive at the same awareness. Being the wise ones that they are, humans soon developed a powerful human motivator, a god, that would allow them, whether leader Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, so, God, whether leader or follower, to maintain the illusion that their existence was indeed leading to a full self awareness of their individuality. Then they created specific values and placed it on each other in the resources of the natural earth. These values would always sustain a continual state of distinction and division assuring individuality and the balance of human happiness. These values began something like this, and uh, they put in a story uh, here called of Ugg and Thug. A long time ago, long before the discovery of silver and gold, there lived a man named Ugg. Ugg. Ugg lived in a community of people who prospered well for that time. They herded sheep, raised cows, and grew grain. One day, while Ugg was fishing in a stream near his home, he noticed a shiny rock exhibiting its countenance through the crystal clear water. That's a nice looking stone, Ugg thought as he retrieved it from its resting place. And as Ugg wondered on the discovery that he had made, he wondered what use this pretty rock could have. He decided that although the rock was beautiful, it served him no real purpose, so he threw it right back. Now that he had discovered the existence of the rock, he began to notice that the stream bed where he was fishing was full of this peculiar looking stone. Ugg's neighbor, Thug, was a lazy sort, and spent many a day down by the stream idly dreaming up ways that he could get out of the responsibilities of work that were required of him by the community of people where he lived. One day, Thug noticed the shiny rock that his friend Ugg had discarded. Hey, thought Thug, I bet I could convince Ugg's wife that this pretty stone is worthy mammoth meat pie. Something lo that Thug loved to eat, but was too lazy to make himself. Thug took the stone and fashioned it into a trinket, and then gave it to Ugg's wife, who upon seeing it immediately fell in love with its shiny attributes. She made Thug his pie, and couldn't wait to show off her new trinket to her friends. Well, thought Thug, well if Ugg's wife liked the stone, maybe all the other women will like one too. I'll never have to make another mammoth meat pie again. So Thug went down to the stream bed and gathered up all the shiny rocks that he could find. When the other men's wives wanted the shiny trinket like Ugg's wife, their husbands searched in vain for the rocks that Thug had already found and took it. The other women were distraught that they could not have the trinket like Miss Ugg. These women began to pester their husbands until the pestering became unbearable. The men went to Thug and asked him for some of his shiny rocks for their wives. What will you give me for one of these rocks? Thugs asked. I, I will build you a fence, said one man. And, and I will give you three cows to put inside the fence, said another. Soon, Thug, the laziest man in town, had the best house, barn, fence, and animals in all the community. Thug spent most of his time looking and digging for the now precious stones. The more he found, the less there were for others to find. 
It wasn't long before Thug made a list of the things for which he could trade his stones. He divided his stones up into groups according to size. The littlest stones he traded for a cow, a sheep, or an ox. A bigger stone he gave in exchange for a new shed to be built on his land. And the biggest stones, well, those he kept for himself, because he knew he could break them into littler stones that he could trade for practically anything he wanted. Ugg's cow died, and he didn't have any way to procure milk for his growing children. He asked his wife if she would li li uh, let him have her trinket, so that he could trade it to his brother, whose wife had one but wanted two for one of their cows. Reluctantly, Ugg's wife gave up her trinket so that her children could have milk. Ugg traded the stone for one of his brother's cows. Ugg's brother, Shrug, took the stone, which was way too big for just one cow, and then traded it to another neighbor for six sheep and five bushels of wheat. Ugg's brother never told him that his wife's stone was worth more than just one cow. He knew that his brother needed a cow more than he needed a stone that he couldn't eat, wear, or sleep in. So he decided he had done his brother a favor. And for the favor, he would get more for the stone than what he gave for it. This situation went on for some time. And before long, the stones were worth more to the people of the community than any of their other possessions. One wise man set up a little business by the bank of the stream where the stones had first been found. His wise promise was to help the people to save their stones and to get more stones by lending them out to others in return for a bigger stone than what they had borrowed in the first place. When this man lent out a stone that was the size of a walnut, he told the borrowers that they would have to pay him back a stone the size of an apple. <gasps> and when this bigger stone was paid back as agreed, then the man would then chip off a little bit of the apple-sized stone for himself, and then gave the person the one that he had uh, deposited into the business, which was bigger than what he had originally deposited. You know, this sounds a lot like money. <sighs> but, okay, let's continue here. What an easy way to get more stones without finding or trading anything for them, boasted the man. Since his business seemed to be successful by the bank of the stream, he then called his business The Bank. Soon the people of the community were spending far more time figuring out ways to get and then trade the stones that they were finding. Rather than raising things to eat or making things to wear, or building houses. It wasn't long before there were lots of stones lying around that no one could eat, wear, or live in. The people began to die from hunger and cold outside, or they were killed by someone wanting their stones. Ugg analyzed what had happened to his community, and called the people together and told them what Thug had done. He explained that Thug had taken advantage of all of them, because he didn't want to work like the rest of the community. He made Thug's name known throughout the land as a lazy con artist who took advantage of the people's industry for his own good. His name has been infamous ever since. It wasn't long before Thug killed his brother for the speaking against him, and because of Thug's riches and power, no one cared. That's the end of the story. I think it has a bunch of uh, meanings that are kind of synonymous with what's going on in our uh, reality here. Yo, thank you, Dave. I <laughs> get you. You be reading on. Oh yeah, the Urantia book. I need to find that somewhere. Well, I probably could just read it off like online here. All right, let's go ahead and continue finishing this chapter here. Our true natures constantly motivate us to maintain our individuality due to our unique awareness that we are different and independent from everything else in the universe. As explained, we are aware of our self, and we use our ability to reason to experience things that validate our existence, or this individuality. 
Therefore, we naturally seek out those things that confirm this uniqueness. From our honest perspective, everything in the universe exists for us to use in our experiences to arrive at our happiness, which is the balance that we seek. The above story, Ugg's wife was aware that wearing a trinket set her apart from others. And when the other women noticed this difference that set Ugg's wife apart from them, they recognized her uniqueness and believed that they too could become different in some way. Once all of them possessed the same bracelet, their individualism was diminished. To separate themselves further from each other, and to reach a state of independent awareness that would bring them balance and happiness, each sought out other things. Maybe two bracelets, or three bracelets instead of one, to recover their distinctiveness. This natural tendency is why humans establish borders, nations, communities, and families. Then we seek for personal riches and emotional securities such as patriotism or religious or group affiliations that separate them from others. Though these things are abstract and are as varied as each particular mind interpreting uh, their meanings and values, they have become as um, uh, they have become an important constant. The utmost desire of a wise one is to search uh, for his natural balance. Even those who do not want borders, nations, communities, or families, and who do not seek material wealth or depend on the emotional securities that distinguish one, one human from another, still protect their individuality by not belonging to the group of those who do seek after these things. Inevitably, it is impossible for humans not to crave their selfish desires no matter what they might be. The leaders that we choose are determined by their abilities to protect and to allow our individuality. The democracies of the world are premised on the ability of the person to choose for themselves the laws and governments that promotes their selfish desires. Governments that allow a person the liberty to exist and to determine what brings balance to the self, and in which guarantees this pursuit of happiness, are unquestionably supported by human nature. These types of governments encourage the perpetual quest for individuality. They promote, or sorry, they promise their supporters the ability to achieve the realization of their selfish dreams. Humans exist on a plan whose natural laws will never satisfy their free-willed intrinsic character. They are not like other creatures of the animal kingdom, that have no concept of self-awareness, and maintain balance by working with natural laws to perpetuate the whole. Working against the laws of nature, human self-awareness supports the individual, and sets a unique standard of balance and happiness, for which it continually seeks. Human intelligence and reason has created a powerful entity of motivation that helps to maintain this balance. This powerful human motivator is a great beast that has no part of the normal orders of the animal kingdom. In other words, the corruption of man has created the dragon, which has given birth to a beast upon whose back the whole of humanity rides. Nothing stands in the way of this dragon and its desires. The beast receives its power from the dragons and then reigns throughout the whole earth. Who would want or dare to make war or to attempt to overthrow the beast that fulfills the very essence of human desire? The next chapter here is chapter 4. I want to go ahead and pause here. Chapter 4 is called The Image. <laughs> so Dave Tucker here, one of my uh, brothers from California, uh, he's mentioning here that I should uh, get my read on for the Urantia book, which I agree. I love uh, the Urantia book. It has some nice things about Jesus in there. Um, so amen, brother. Let's, let's, that's a good idea.
All right, so there you go, Dave. I think I will, if I have some time I'll, in a little bit, I would love to read some of the pa um, papers on Jesus. Now, the next chapter here is called The Image. I'll go ahead and read this last chapter here and then put this reading to a close. Because of their intelligence and ability to reason, the wise ones have progressed and evolved in their ability to protect the self and its desires. Standards of living have been created that determine the measure of happiness associated with human behavior. It might be argued that one who spends many days traveling hundreds of miles by foot to reach a desired destination pales in comparative balance or happiness to one who can travel that same distance in a matter of minutes on an airplane. If presented with both options of travel, one who has the ability to reason measures each option by the standard that brings the most balance. The innate realm of personal choice that supports each individual creates variables, which cannot be ignored when a standard of balance is being sought. One who travels by foot might enjoy the fresh air and the exercise, while the one who travels by airplane might enjoy the time saved. The purpose for the trip must be considered, as well as the desired destination. As the wise ones reason their ways to continue all advancements in technology and science, they convinced themselves that the standard of living necessary to maintain the quintessential balance must remain the purpose and end of these advancements. Their ability to reason supports the idea, for example, that if a person wants to travel from point A to point B, that it would seem logical that whatever can be done to expedite the trip would lend to a more perfect balance. Ignoring the laws of nature which mandate that a 50-ton mass cannot disregard the law of gravity, that these wise ones used their superior intellect and free will to find a better way to make the trip in less time. Once they arrived at what they believed to be a more balanced inn, in this example the fastest means of travel, then they set a standard by which they measured the balance or happiness. Once the standard is set, most humans are convinced that they must measure themselves by that standard. Surely one who walks 300 miles by foot is perceived as foolish if an airplane is available to offer an alternative uh, means of transportation. The end becomes more important than the means to reach it. The end is happiness. And what of the wise ones must do to reach this end, they will do. No matter what natural law they must circumvent or violate in order to accomplish their goal. The consequences of ignoring the natural laws of the earth have little importance to the wise ones once their fundamental needs are satisfied. These needs are the same as those of the animal kingdom, for example, food, sex, and survival. The fulfillment of these needs, or better, the subjection to and the compliance with the natural laws that mandate them, does not achieve the realization of human existence, which is the awareness of the self. In pursuit of individualism and uniqueness, the wise ones violate and ignore natural laws, subjecting themselves to the resultant penalties and consequences. In the example above, sitting on an airplane without ex exercising the functions of the body will cause muscles and joints to atrophy, whereas a leisurely walk of many miles, without any time restraints, would add to the health and vitality of the individual. The desired end is the destination, but the human cost is the means that is not reasoned or calculated into the scenario, because it is not given the same value as is given to the satisfaction experienced at the end, or hence uh, the re you know reaching the destination quickly. 
free-willed beings have no laws that they must obey, no instincts that guide them, and even less natural ability to accomplish their desires, which have little or nothing to do with natural law. There is no law of nature that presupposes or mandates happiness and the smile that produces it in a human being. The uniqueness of the smile is the emotional end result of a preconceived desire being fulfilled. When no results are experienced which end in a smile, people refer to the natural laws to which they are beholden in an attempt to feel satisfied, which they perceived as balance and happiness. They know that eating satisfies the pangs of hunger, thus proving that there is always one end that can be satisfied through free agency. Therefore, as one example, when a human is sad because of the inability to reach the desired end of a preconception, they eat and eat and eat, something that they can control by circumventing natural law, whereas animals eat to live, not live to eat. Some couples stay together, not because they necessarily like each other, but because they know through experience that the natural law that mandates sexual urges can be satisfied, and a semblance of balance and happiness can be achieved in doing so. Humans will always find ways to satisfy themselves temporarily, but rarely attain lasting happiness. The long-term effects of circumventing the laws of nature, which have been followed by all other animals for millions of years, are not measured when the expected standard is the end fulfillment of human behavior, happiness. Once a standard is set and accepted by the whole of humanity, it isn't long before exercising free will motivates an individual to set him or herself apart from or above the whole by attempting to change the established standard. The reason for continual scientific and technological advancements has little to do with what is best for the whole, but all to do with what will help to promote individuality. To be the one who discovers the next great step in the standardization of human happiness lends to the constant desire to be recognized apart from the whole. Thence we have inventors, explorers, scientists, actors, musicians, athletes, business icons, or whoever differentiates and distinguishes themselves from all others, all have one common goal. To become the one who sets the self apart from the rest. However, these personal goals are not shared by everyone. There are many, many wise ones who have no interest in setting themselves apart from others in this way, but who have found their own happiness in other ways. They have no desire to outdo their peers, and consequently, they contribute little to the advancements of technology. You know that ostensibly support human happiness. Yet even so, they too, in their own way, seek individuality. So ironically, through their efforts to establish a universal standard of living by which all can benefit, the wise ones have created their own opposition and challenges, which diametrically oppose the balance or happiness that they seek. From technological advancements. Cities are developed, and concentrated on small tracts of land where happiness is hardly experienced by their citizens. To escape the urban sprawl and the crowding effects of these advancements, humans escape to the mountains, deserts, and other natural environments left unaffected by the standard of living effectuated by the wise ones, and that are forced upon the masses. Humankind circumvents natural law and its environment in search of happiness, and then ironically returns to these same environments in their natural state to recapture and experience what they had lost through their own actions. 
All humans want to experience happiness. Nothing is more soothing and providing、uh, more comfort than an unforced smile that comes as a result of a preconceived notion or desired goal being fulfilled. Goals are based on what is conjured up in the mind. They are images created by the desire to experience happiness, which are directly associated with the need to sustain individuality in a vast sea of humanity. From the moment a little girl, for example, is able to distinguish herself from others, she begins to establish fundamental concepts of her world and what she must do to maintain who and what she is, and what she should do when she becomes an adult. Human aspirations lead to miraculous discoveries, intended to promote the conception of self-realization. Television, books, magazines, and predominantly the examples of the adults around her, who appear to a child as those who have a stable and secure self-image, they create images for this little girl. And from these images, she must formu- formulate her desire to become someone or something that either fits securely within the standardized images. Or to put herself above them. Her balance in life becomes dependent on her ability to reach the desired end of her preconceptions. She competes with thousands of her peers, who also imagine themselves as the next great actress, model, musician, businesswoman, or president. Each living her life, hoping to experience the end result of fulfilling their dreams. For the majority of little girls, it will always be just a dream. Their lives will be spent in misery and stress as they attempt to realize a persistent but virtually hopeless illusion. These dreams are based on an image formed in their minds when they first entered the world. This idea was shared by billions of others with the same quest, attempting to find out who and what they are as individuals. These young women are tragically convinced that they do not fit in properly, nor do they fulfill the purpose of their existence, and to find happiness unless their preconceived images become a reality. The image takes precedence over the natural laws that have been. Violated by the corruption of man, the dragon and the beast give life to this image, causing all upon the earth to worship and to desire it above all else. A hope of a life of happiness has become a dependence upon this image, and those who fail to live up to its expectations or standards will lose that life. In essence, they seem to be killed, and those who relentlessly pursue and worship this、uh, image have no rest day or night. Well, has it been said of those placed above others as successful, rich, as living the dream? It is not in what is real, but it has all to do in, with the image. That's the end of chapter four, which is called the image. The next chapter here is called the mark, which、uh, in the book of Revelations we've all have heard a little bit about the mark of the beast, or the mark of our society upon people, so that we are all similar to one another, rather than individuals. Chapter four was amazing to read. Um, and it made me start thinking a lot about how I also chase the idea of becoming an artist or a musician, a thing that sets myself apart from others, and gives me the conception that I'm an individual. We'll see how、um, my thinking adapts to what this book、uh, reveals to you know myself and to you. Please provide any comments in the section below so that we can all come to a greater understanding.
go ahead and read chapter five here. Let me see. It's two eleven. I came in here an hour ago. All right, everything's good. Hey, so thanks for joining. I'm going to have one more reading after this, but it's going to be from another book. One that was um, recommended by my friend Dave. Peace and blessings, everyone. And happy enlightenment. Happy awakening.